and we're live good evening everyone welcome to bigfoot odyssey this is sunday encounters uh you know we lost our guest uh we got her name now erica erica loggins uh was she was slated to be on here today and uh not sure what happened but she wasn't able to make it so uh i said you know i guess there's probably a lot of people that uh that haven't heard my encounter or you know the, the whole reason we do this what got all this started and uh so i said why not we'll do it i'll tell it again and maybe try to give a little bit more of the the genesis and what i think happened and and why it all went down the way it did and my state of mind and all that good stuff so uh so here we are how are you daniela i'm doing good thank you well, I was trying to you. think of some uh, new things to ask you about that day as you go through it. Right. Uh, trying to look at it from a different angle or, you know, if you were aware of these things, like we're trying to spread the awareness now. Right. How would that have changed the day for you or how would it have changed your reactions? Sure. That would be interesting to know. You well, know. I don't think it would have had the branding, the lasting effect that i think uh that i ultimately experienced from it but uh we won't wait too much longer uh really appreciate all the the new members that have joined lately if you want to join be a member of bigfoot odyssey you can do that if you're not if you're not on ios if you're on your pc or you have android uh you can look down beside the subscribe button and you should see a join button you can go there and join us two dollars and 99 cents a month and uh we use that to buy t-shirts and swag to give back to members only. Plus we have members only content. We do, we try to do a show twice a month. Uh, that's just for the members. And we try to get the higher profile researchers and, and people, uh, friends of ours to, uh, to do the show for you guys. So, uh, thank you. If you do have iOS and iPhone, uh, or an iMac, I'm not sure if you could do it iMac or not go to, and people were having an issue with this. Uh, when I say go to our homepage and people were going to the website, which was bigfootodyssey.us, they were going to the website forward slash join and it was bringing up an error. Our homepage is, is when you go to our channel on YouTube. Um, and in the top right corner, there's three little dots and you can hit that and it'll say share. So you just hit share, copy, and you can paste that in your Safari and then type forward slash join J O I N on the end hit go and it should bring you straight to the members page. I tried to post uh, the link all together, but for some reason it doesn't, it doesn't work. It'll only let me put the link. It won't add the, the whole forward slash join thing there. So again, we appreciate everyone that's joined here and uh, very much appreciated, but I'm going to get into this. Um, <sighs> nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Those that don't know, I have a very nasty habit. I, I, I dip snuff. And I try not to do it whenever I'm doing a show. That's another bad habit of dropping my phone. Uh, I was like, you know what? I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do it. I do the Zen. Uh, I guess you don't tell it that often, do you really? Not here. I've never told it here. Uh, not, in, not in full everything. So mm. I've told it, you know plenty of other channels um because it's, it's all i got uh, as far as bigfoot goes very little research that i've done actual you know field stuff i can talk about making films making documentaries and and seeing a uh, booger in the woods so i guess i just kind of want to i want to prep preface the whole thing with kind of a state of mind where i was the reason i was in that particular place and why I was out there so much, which which is, I believe, what ultimately brought everything about is is just because I was there so much um, around them all the time. Didn't know it totally, completely oblivious, though. I do think that uh, that they thought I knew they were there. Who knows? So. Well, it, it, the whole thing started in back in 1999 when I had 
a, a lot. It was just a weird year altogether. I was 26 years old. Um, and it just, the whole thing started out bad. Um, a guy I was working with, he, he worked opposite of me whenever I wasn't there. He was, did the same job. Um, died. His wife ran over him on accident. Uh, <clears throat> he was chasing the car down and he ran over. So anyway, and then it was just, and then my boss died. And then uh, one of my best friends, there were, there were four of us that were really close. Uh, we were all born the same day of the month, sixth day, same year, different months. And uh, so we were all born on the sixth of, it was March, June, March, May, June, and uh, October. So the first one was uh, Carl, called him Rat, he drowned. Then two months later, the next one, Scott, car rat. Um, then my mother, no, no, then my dad died. Then uh, grandmother leaving our house, he got hit by a log truck. Uh, then my dad, then another friend we went to school with uh, died. Then the, the last two, me and Sam, we were the only two left, you know, of the group. And uh, I was drinking a lot then. And we had gone to a place called uh, Mug Shots. And we had probably gotten there at 8 or 9 o'clock. And I was just plastered, you know, really, really down on myself. My, my mother had just died two weeks before. So, and after losing everybody else, it was just like, didn't care. So I was drinking quite a bit. And uh, not the thing to do, kids, by the way. So we go there together, and uh, it was November 21st. It was three days before Thanksgiving. He left. He had gone. Someone had called him. He was going to do something. I said, well, okay, because I rode with him. I said, you'd be back here to pick me up closing time because I was going to close it down. So 2 a.m. comes, and... Uh, he doesn't show up. So I called a cab, made it home and got there. Hospital calls and Sam was in the hospital. He, he had died at the scene coming to pick me up. Met head on with another vehicle. So it was just me, you know, the four, we all had the same tattoo. I got mine covered up after that. Um, so that just kind of did it for me. I think that was that was the ninth person close to me in a 10 month period of time that I just lost. And I guess I thought and I feel like maybe I had every reason to think that I was next. Mm. You know. That's Everybody a lot else of, is going. That's a lot of losses, isn't it? In in such as Yeah, I didn't process any of it. No. Didn't process it, didn't deal with any of it. So I had Maybe a week or so before, uh, a guy that I'd worked with was talking about some property that his grandfather had. And, you know, after that, I, I sought him out. Like, take me to your grandfather's property. Well, he takes me to this place. And it has been, no one had been out there in generations. I mean, it was so overgrown and it's 240 acres, kind of oblong. Uh, square rectangle long way square so but it was behind their house and it was in collins mississippi uh dan easterling road you go down to a place called garway lane that was the man's name was garway mcgee well he lived on the corner and all his family lived on the road in front well there was another road that went down the side that you had to go down to go into this little like a leash road that's where they had gone in and logged some of the some of the timber in the back so he takes me out there and it was perfect for me you know i i talked to him said i'll uh he didn't want anything he said just make the run out nobody goes out there you know you have the run of the place so uh that was fine with me and so that's exactly what i did and over i think pretty much immediately i started noticing 
kind of strange things, things I didn't, hadn't noticed anywhere else. And I had hunted since I was five years old, going out deer hunting with my dad. And, you know, eventually getting to where I was about 14, I started hunting by myself. I didn't like to go hunting with other people. I didn't matter where I went. I just liked to go hunt by myself. <clears throat> so this was perfect for me. And so that's what I did. I just kind of sunk myself out in this place. And I was there, whether it was hunting season or not, I was just there 300 plus days a year. And I can't say that I was, that I had turned into the best person in the world. You know, I, and, and I knew it. Uh, I, I was very standoffish. Uh, with people. I didn't really want to engage with anyone. Uh, you know, if, if I was ever out, I didn't do family functions, none of that stuff. And if I was ever out somewhere that I had to be, I made it a point not to make eye, con with it, eye contact with anybody. I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to have any anything to do with anybody. And uh, so my own way of dealing with everything. And uh, whew. I feel with them, um grief sometimes you, your tolerance level changes doesn't it when you've lost someone you, things kind of get, get into perspective and you, for some reason for me you, my tolerance really dropped I couldn't tolerate things as much as I used to be able to and and I think that's pressure isn't it and maybe that's what it was for you you know yeah well, built up of. sure but the biggest most revealing thing about a man is his ego and I was no different than anyone else then you know I was feeling sorry for myself and it was you know it was just a big pity party for me and you know making it a point to whoever maybe I was angry with God or whatever but I wasn't I just wasn't very nice and it was intentional and uh and I knew it and it kind of comes into play uh later on but through the years, things would happen. Um, I can I can remember several times sitting in a, a shooting house that I'd built. I had a couple. Watching the grass. This, this is the same one I heard where I heard the kids play. Sitting there and hearing people talk behind me like, like they're coming up the trail 50 feet. And so I open the back and yell, hey, you know, I'm back here. Don't come back here. And it would stop. But there was, I mean, it, realistically, there was nobody going out there. Nobody ever went out there. There was no reason for them to go out there. But I heard those voices several times. Hearing uh, what I what I knew was somebody. I, I would see I was suspicious that someone was out there messing with me. Just sometimes I just had this feeling there's somebody out here and they're just messing with me. And, you know, I'm, I'm not the person you need to be messing with, it's, you know ego again i was so so sure of everything out there and so full of myself that uh i just it was blinders you know i just i knew there was nothing you could have told me about anything out there but i one night that i remember for sure uh i would i would hunt i'd be there at daylight and then i would hunt until probably 10 11 but instead of driving all the way home I would just, or I would hunt until dark, but instead of driving home and then come back for daylight, I would just sleep in my truck, build me a little fire, sit out for a little while, get in the truck, sleep, get up and hunt before daylight. I did that a lot. Well, I can remember sitting around, had a little fire going, and I heard an owl, but it was not an owl. This was a guy. This was who, who, breathy and deliberate. And I, I don't recall exactly what I said, but it was something to the effect of, okay, yeah, you know, it's only one person knew exactly where I was, and that was the, the guy I worked with, um, it, Tim. He's he's either letting me know he's coming or he's messing with me, but it kind of sounded like it's coming from the direction of the trail. Nobody ever came up. Nothing ever happened. That kind of freaked me out a little bit. So I think I might have gotten my truck thinking somebody's out here, you know, get the guns prepared and ready but nothing ever happened and i think a little bit later on i remember hearing uh what sound what i thought was somebody imitating a fox yip and they're pretty fox are pretty loud when they do it but it was in a different direction like 50 yards or so behind me so that was just a weird situation um early one afternoon being in my shooting house and this is years 
before I ever saw anything. Um, early, I was in three thirty, and I was in there really early, <clears throat> waiting. Sorry. Usually, I turn my camera off so I can take a drink. Not today. This is my this is my soda fix for the day. Ginger ale. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and I heard kids, what I thought was kids screaming, yelling at each other, like they're playing down in the Creek, straight out ahead of me, 200 yards, you know, back and forth, high pitch. So I thought it might've been kids. So I was like, oh, I can't shoot that way. I got to get out. So I did, I get out and lumber down there and there's nobody there. And where the creek was for, from the position I was up to the right, about 700 yards, half a mile was the house. I didn't hear anybody. And it's so thick between there and there. There's just no getting there. You know, it just, none of it made any sense. So that was kind of strange and freaky that I just knew there was somebody down there and it had definitely ruined my hunt for that day. Um, the knocks, the knocks were just all the time. And what I never really understood and realized was that there was just a couple, maybe three or four at a time, but it was always happening. And I heard them at two o'clock in the morning, way off. Bow, bow, bow. In my mind, and I rationalized this way, it's a buck. And he's <laughs> ridiculous to think about now. You find something, don't sure. You? What else is it? <clears throat> um, so, uh, but I heard knocking a lot. Every time I would pull in there on my four wheeler, just about and get off, I would hear it sounded like coming from the direction of the house. It sounded closer, but hey, it's carrying through the woods or whatever. But it sounded like it's coming from the hollow. Four, five, loud bangs, you know, rhythmic. And I just, I think that was them just letting everyone else know, hey, here he comes. <clears throat> uh, a lot of things like that. Well, the i think it was the year before maybe two years before uh i was getting some good bucks on camera and uh but they were coming in after dark like a half hour so i was trying to find a place deeper in where i thought they might be bedding so i can kind of catch them on the way while it's still daylight and uh so i had a pretty good spot picked out i'd gotten down in there and this is how sure and full of myself i was uh, I got lost. I know where I'm going, but it was, it was late February, maybe. Yeah, it definitely was, uh, misting rain. So I can't see it's overcast. There's no stars. Can't hear traffic. And then when it's dark, I don't care who you are. The woods look all the same in every direction. Your sense of direction is just gone. So I have seven millimeter Magnum, have my rifle, had a, a, this is before LEDs were any good. Uh, the, the mag light, the policeman's, you know, the 4d battery, big black mag light. And so I say, okay, well, the best I can do is try to find the lowest area because maybe that'll lead me to the Creek bed. I know where that comes out. And so eventually I found that trudging off through the thicket and, uh, I'm walking th down, I'm beside the Creek, but I'm still in the Creek bed. There's elevation, you know, 60 feet to 40 feet wide it goes up hill on both sides so i'm trudging through and i probably get 15 feet away from these whatever this was and it was just commotion i mean bodies and i, I can remember hearing <laughs> you know like a a grunting like breathy grunting sound well i mean i just i guess i did i froze and i'm hearing this whatever these huge things i did it again oh so sorry <clears throat> running away but they didn't run away they went straight behind me and stopped and i remember that they only went like 20 or 30 feet and stopped because i thought it was hogs and i thought they were coming back because hogs it, are they're just they're terrible terrible creatures <laughs> they destroy your land and if they ever get mad at you, a boar hog will hook you. He'll throw you in the air and hook on you while you're in the air. You know, knock you on the ground, turn around and come back through and strafe you and just lay you open. You know, they'll kill you. 
<clears throat> and then probably eat you. So I was, I was definitely a scared. I have my seven mad, but I'm looking for a tree to get up. And I, and I did, I didn't climb a tree, but I can remember maybe holding on to one and just waiting to hear them come back. And they never did. I think I was there for maybe 15 or 20 more minutes, but kind of weird. Uh, and, and thought I had heard like footsteps running off, like, tch, 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 tch. but an animal can sound like that sometimes, if, especially if they're running. So, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't like everything else that I can remember. It was, I just knew that this was hogs, though. I'd never seen a hog out there the whole time. Never seen a hog track the whole time. <clears throat> so I'd found them all of a sudden. So I finally trudge on through and come out. Uh, I found a trail that I recognized and knew exactly where I was. It came out to the place where I'm with my camping. But the story I told at the time, uh, when I talked to anybody, uh, a couple of people at work was that, man, I walked up in the middle of a bunch of hogs last night. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think the following year I had gone back down in that same area and hunted did the same thing because again i'm getting these big bucks on camera big nice for mississippi but it's like 30 minutes after dark you know they're just big bucks get big for a reason they're smart so i'm sitting there sun's going down it's just about dark and a whole rafter of turkeys get up to roost right beside me like within 30 or 40 feet scared the mess out of me you know Turkeys have big wings, but when they get up to roost, especially all of them, it was loud, a bunch of commotion. Light bulb. There's turkeys out here. You know, I'd never seen turkeys anywhere. Of course, I didn't hunt in the back. I always hunted up front. I know where they are. I can turkey hunt. All right. Never turkey. I tried turkey hunting in there when I first went in, in the front, but it was, to me, it was useless because I just didn't think there was anything out there uh, like that. So... I decided I found a spot where I, that was pretty close to there. It's probably about 75 yards from where that was up a hill, nice clear area, about half the size of a, of a quarter. I'd say a quarter, the size of a football field, which is a hundred yards by 50 yards. <clears throat> and if you look at this, like it is a football field, the east and west would be the end zones, south sideline, north sideline. Well, the south side line dropped straight off, probably about seven feet, straight down into the beginning of the creek bed. And it was kind of like two-tier drop off, and then it dropped on off down into the creek. And that creek kind of wrapped around that place. So it was that low elevation, and it just kind of graded up to the, to the southeast end zone there in the corner and on around and up, and it was level. Well, coming in... Coming in to the west end zone, you came up a hill, and there's this kind of open. It had there was a few trees in, it and it was full of sagebrush. So I burned it. I walked all the way around, and that almost got out of hand on me. That I remember now, um, chasing that in you know middle of February. I, I want to say it was a week or ten days uh, before I had gone out there to hunt. So I get all that ready. And, you know, the reason I burned it is because turkeys like stuff like that. You know, they'll come and pick the seeds and dead bugs. And, and I think the turkeys had been in there at some time during that week. I stayed up in the front. I didn't go back there until I decided to go hunt. So I got up that morning. I think it was a Saturday. Uh, I think because I looked, I had to look it up later. I actually, I did it just recently. It was a Saturday because I thought it was a Saturday or Sunday. It was March the 10th. It was 2007. I got in there, pulled up in the, in the yard in my truck, had a, a 05 avalanche. I took my, my four-wheeler just barely fit in the bed of it. There's a small bed on this truck. I offloaded my four-wheeler. I can almost fully camoed out. Uh, I got the real tree. And it's got the little leaves hanging off of it, you know. And then I, I wish I had all the money back that I'd spent hunting. I would retire right now. Um, I had a Ricondo style hat on, and I had a black. I think I had black grease paint under my eyes. I'm pretty sure I did. But I had a 
a khaki green mesh net that goes over your face. So I had, I had all that stuff in my backpack. I get on the four wheeler and as soon as I pulled into the road, sometimes I would pull all the way in or I would about halfway. It was a bad road. It's, it's a good road now. They fixed it because they came back and logged some more, but it's a logging road. There's no reason for anybody to keep it up. Nobody's going back there. So it was bad. You're not going to get a conventional vehicle down there, period. But to this day, I said, well, I'll just walk back. It was early. It was probably 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning. It's still dark. So I pulled in and I pulled to the right. And where I pulled up to was a bunch of small pine trees, like really thick, really close together. And I just kind of pushed right up against them with the four-wheeler got off got all my stuff and I walked in well I got back there when you come into this area that looks like a football field just to the left not quite in the corner probably 20 feet up from the corner on the north sideline is where I decided I was gonna get I had stepped off where that was all the way to that corner it was 24 yards it was 72 feet and I had gotten some gallberry bushes two or three feet tall and I kind of placed them out there where I could sit down and be hidden because you got to hide from turkeys. You know, turkeys are not very smart, but don't even blink because if they see you, that's how they survive. <clears throat> so I get there, I get sat down, I probably maybe 10 feet to my left and then back another four feet is a lop lolly pine tree. Low, low limbs, you know, most Georgia pine and, you know, yellow pine, have no limbs on them until you get 15, 20 feet up, especially in South Mississippi. But this one, so we call it a lop pine, because it's got low hanging limbs. It was just like a bush pine tree right there, but it was huge. It was, you know, a huge pine tree. So I sit down and I can see days breaking. It's probably, you know, I can see the skyline, the trees. <clears throat> And so I think I might have waited a little bit. I think I ate something. I was snacking on something or whatever. And uh, I started calling. I had, a, I had a chirp reed that you put in your mouth. You put it in your upper palate. And it's just try to sound like a sexy hen. And I had a box call. So I wanted to sound like multiple, more than one. I didn't have any decoys. But, but I had a locator. And a locator kind of looks like those black um, toilet plungers, you know, that are completely kind of looks like that. And you shake it and you shake it. And the idea is not to not to sound like a big gobbler, but to sound like a young one, because young gobblers, Jake's is what they call them. They don't finish it. They just kind of halfway. And that's it. You know, big gobbler. He'll sound off. So you hit that and then and I was go two hours probably at least the sun was up good it was at least 8 or 8 30 in the morning at this point and I'm starting to see turkeys they're coming <clears throat> they're all coming all through the woods what I could see which was just down to my left there's a game trail pretty wide it was three or four feet wide game trail I could see turkeys coming up that I could see some coming through the woods and they're coming they don't come really quick, but they were on their way. So I'm getting excited, right? And I can I don't see any big gobblers, but I do see there's a couple of jakes together with some hens, and they're coming up that game trail. And that's who they were they were in the lead, so that's who I was watching. Well, they get where where the hill crests and it kind of you can't see anything because it dies over the horizon there of the hill. I see their heads coming up and they stopped. When they stopped, it's like they all perked up and then gone they all flew north even the ones in the woods that's when i could really tell how many it was it was at least 30. there might have probably more than that but it, i knew it was at least 30 it was a bunch of birds but they were getting the heck out of dodge so obviously i'm upset i don't think they saw me but they had they must have i've done i did something wrong here so i was kind of sitting there pretty dejected but just probably about the time I couldn't hear them anymore, I could hear what sounded like something or somebody straight out across from me, maybe, maybe to my right a little bit. Well, 
whatever that is or whoever that is, they had a direct line of sight right through the creek bed to them. That's who scared the turkeys off. It wasn't me or, or whatever. But it was it, it sounded like tsh, tsh, pretty slow. So I, I was thinking it had to be somebody. So I'm, I stood up and I remember when I stood up and I grabbed my mesh and I pulled it off my face like this with the, this hand. Yeah. Pull the mesh down and I'm just kind of looking over. And I didn't see anybody. So I took a couple steps toward that pine tree. And when I finally saw who it was, <clears throat> probably 150 feet away through the thicket, down on that first tier, you could see just about really clear about from here up. It's a black guy, which made sense. The property belongs to a black family, an old black man. His whole family's out there. It's one of them. He's not pretty, uh, but still long ways off and he was dark. So, but that's, that's my frame of reference was this is who this is. This black guy. And I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't get a really good look at him until he had got up pretty almost past me and he was turning his head and look at me like this. He look his head and look back where he's going. Well, I wave my hand. Yeah, I'm right here because he's looking at me. Didn't realize it dawned on me how he knew where I was. But I think I might have been thinking because I never hunted past deer season and I wasn't sure who came out there and did what, you know, for turkey season. But everything about it, and, and it was all in my own head because everything about it just screamed amateur. This guy has no idea what he's doing. He's just, you know, really upsetting me so well i could i couldn't see him anymore and i know he had to walk kind of away down around the point and come back because i could still hear him but the next time i see him he's kind of coming quarter toward me and he's not really i don't think he was looking at me at that point but i but i'm i'm looking and i'm like oh dude i mean i was just like i said it just screamed amateur he's wearing no orange for one and i had leaned up against that pine tree and i put my shotgun down to my left and i put my hand up over the butt just like this a non-aggressive i'm not going to shoot at you don't shoot at me position what you should do so i'm kind of watching and he's he's a little ways away and i when i can finally kind of start to see clearly he doesn't look quite right he looks like about a 400 pound really fat guy that's wearing either coveralls or something to the like I was always thinking this he's wearing something weird again amateur has no idea what he's doing but with a camouflage vest is kind of what it looked like well now he's hunting okay I was really upset at that point this guy's out here hunting and whether it's their property or not someone should have talked to me and told me because this is how people get shot you know, there's no communication here. This is all the stuff I'm going to hit him with when I see him. Again, doesn't look quite right. There was something weird, I think, about his head maybe uh, that, I, that I can remember. But he was lumbering like he was tired. And, and I thought, well, why didn't he just come up, you know, right there? He knew I was here. And I was like, well, I guess he's tired. He's a big old dude, you know, and he's lost strolling through the thick stuff out there so i'm watching him and i'm just you know mr confident about everything so i'm looking at him come up and he reaches his arm out there's two pine trees where the where the end of that corner is what i'd stepped off maybe eight or ten feet kind of down that grade are two pine trees this big around half grown and they're three or four feet apart well the one to the right, he's coming up to that, and he reached his arm out to grab it. And I could see his arm was long, and he's got this massive, huge forearm. But I could see dark gray skin on the inside of his arm. See hair hanging down, long hair coming off here. Still didn't register that this is anything but a guy, but he's, he's wearing something weird. You know, he's wearing something strange. And I think the point where everything started to flip was when he grabbed the tree and he pulled right up to it and he put the tree right in his chest and i think he had his hand on the back side because i don't remember him seeing his fingers on the other side i mean to, to me this is uncomfortable but i think this is what he was doing 
and he stood up and when he stood up and squared up and i mean he was square very wide shoulders wide i mean all the way down tall i mean i'm about in my boots i'm about six five with boots on and he was we're looking out of eye 80 feet away he's down a grade he's a foot taller than me at least <clears throat> well that was the point i think the the point of transition where i was still questioning myself but i i thought sasquatch i thought this has is is that what this is no this has to be a guy this is kind of a waffling back and forth you know because within seconds as well trying sure. to, to yeah absolutely out. but i think what sealed the deal was when he opened his mouth because he opened his mouth and i could see his teeth were really white at least in, in contrast to his face he's got these white teeth and he starts making the most unnerving sound i've ever heard in my life the only thing i even remotely close to it was the sierra sounds when you hear these two that sound like they're kind of griping at each other and it's just it's this abrupt <laughs> that tone it was in that tone it sounded like multiple sets of vocal cords you could feel it that that was when i was pretty sure this is a sasquatch this is what everyone has been seeing in the woods and reporting and i was such a level of disbelief for me i think i was frozen i'm pretty sure i was frozen in this position right here well he comes up and he's just giving it to me like i like i've done something wrong well i'm mortified I, I felt like the way I describe it is somebody poured a bucket of cold water over my head. I could feel the blood rush from my face. Oh. Just a sinking feeling like I, I, the, all of a sudden this is a guy and then, oh, oh, you know, it's not a guy, oh. but still in disbelief, essentially in shock, like I suppose. So he's right there as far as you would throw a football with somebody I can see everything clearly now i can really see what i thought was camouflage looks like mud all on mostly on one side the right side so i thought it was a vest because it didn't look like there was anything on his arms or his face but leaves and twigs and i could see the dark gray skin under his hair i mean this is this has to be a sasquatch but there was no hair on his face and he looked a lot like a person coming up until he got there and his face completely changed had these huge ball cheeks mm. and a very prognathic protruding mouth huge you could have put a softball in this thing's mouth I, I don't remember seeing his eyes because i think they you know they were deep and it was the sun was behind him which i think was all part of the plan excuse me i got a mm. Yes, um, I always think, I said, I've not before, he must have known you were there to have walked around as well, rather than yeah, just come know. straight up to you. No doubt. There's a reason for that. Absolutely. And we can get into that. Um, so I'm here. I'm like this. And I guess I got the nerve. I just I want to get my hand down on the grip of my gun because it's up here. And I have a Benelli three and a half inch, 12 gauge automatic with a 30 inch barrel. It's a goose gun, but it's perfect for turkeys for a long shot. High brass number four. And I didn't take the plug out. It came with the plug in it and I just never took it out. So I had three shots, still nothing to sneeze at. That's pretty powerful. You know, you blow somebody away with that. Excuse me, ginger ale. <clears throat> as soon as I move my hand, to get it on the grip he doesn't like it and he probably rocked three times two or three times and lunged toward me but with a huff a, a blow a huff it wasn't a yell but it was very powerful like oh, like no you know you're not putting your hand on that gun well i think maybe just about the time i'm getting my hand down on the grip is when it hit me because i felt it like standing in front of a big speaker you know that you feel that wave and it startled me and i think that might have been enough for me to actually move i ran three or maybe four or five steps 
out into the clear where I could really see him good now. I mean, at, at least from just about his waist up, I can see really good. And I can also, I can see his left hand also through the, because it was high uh, sagebrush, probably two feet tall sagebrush on the edge there. He's standing down there right beside that one tree, kind of thick out behind him. And then it cleared up to the left where I saw the turkeys coming. So I, I get off and now I'm ready. My safety's off. I'm ready because I'm sure he is coming after me. This is how he's behaving. Like, like he wanted to hurt me. Yeah. I mean, he must have been terrified. Absolutely. Uh, uh, like These say, are my last moments. Trying to I'm, work out what this is and in seconds. This well, is I'm, the other thing, isn't it? I'm 800 yards from my four wheeler, oh. half a mile. We measured it. So I'm at least going to have to fight this thing all the way out of here. You know, and I'm, and all this things are where am I going to shoot it are going through my head and he's rocking back and forth. And now that I've come out from under this low limb pine tree, I can see and hear this tree he's holding on to. And it's, it is, whipping for people couldn't have done what he was doing he could have picked it out of the ground and thrown it at me that was that that was that really scared me because that was that first real sense of power after the huff that I, that i just knew this thing had it, had it all over me uh -huh. but it started to dawn on me that these things had been here this is not something that just showed up i've been dealing with not dealing with but they've been out here the entire time and it was the perfect place for them. Nobody ever went out there. It was thick. There were five uh, chicken houses within a mile of everywhere around there, which come to find out later, people lost chickens all the time. Uh, perfect place for them. Perfect habitat. Creek, water. And anyway, then you come it, along looking for their turkeys. Yeah, well, they tolerated me, you know, for seven years. Anyway, he... Uh, he quit doing that. He was doing it fast. But what he was doing, what I think he was doing was talking. But he was doing it slow. It was, I and then he would get real loud. And then mumble. And then get loud. And I mean, there was just, I'm completely and totally freaked out. And he went after he had, that was before he had started shaking and doing the tree thing. So I'm standing there. He stopped shaking, went back, did maybe a couple more growls, grunts, whatever he was saying to me. Uh, get out of here, probably. And peeled his lips back, showed all of his teeth. I could see his teeth, my straight hand gap in his front teeth. He had long canines on top and bottom. Not super long, but longer, longer than ours and longer than his other teeth. And stuck his tongue straight out just like like not at me just out like tasting the air or something mm. and that kind of creeped me out a little bit or maybe a lot i don't know i wasn't i wasn't i don't remember feeling anything in this in these moments but once he did that he took his hand off a tree he turned his body to the right put his leg all in one motion just turned and he didn't he didn't take his eyes off me but he didn't turn his head this way, he had his head down like this and turned it like that. So he's looking upside down, kind of sideways at me, right across his shoulder, looking at me two or three steps, not quick, just lumber off, same way he lumbered up. And I couldn't see him, but I could still hear him. And I'm still standing there. And I and I was looking to my left. I remember thinking, I need something to, about to ambush me over here to the left. I mean, nothing did, but I just remember doing that real quick, looking to the left and then trying to look for him. <clears throat> and once he got down, maybe, uh, I think the bottom the creek bottom was probably 60 yards down there. I think maybe he had gotten about that far and I'm still standing there. And that's when he yelled. And I know it was him because that's the direction he was going. That's the direction that came from, but it wasn't, it sounded like something a baboon would do very abrupt wow i mean it just sounded like it cracked at the end and it was so loud that once that happened 
there was not another sound in the woods. I remember the wind was blowing a little bit. I could, I, the grass, I remember seeing the grass, this, the green grass, this tall on the edge. And I, but I still stood there for a couple of minutes. And just, I can't believe what's happening. This is, this is crazy. At the same time, it's all making sense. Everything I'd experienced, all the weird stuff, the hogs I ran into, you know, and then there was, but not only that, knowing there was more than one, but there has to be several out here. So I'm standing there and then all of a sudden I just, I can feel myself. I remember noticing my breathing. I'm taking long, deep breaths, like I'd run a mile, you know, and then heat on the periphery, like I'm about to pass out. So I think at, that was that point where I spun around real quick, walked over, got my backpack. I still have that backpack, by the way. I put it over my shoulder and I left everything else laying there and I started to walk out. And I probably went about 20 feet and I stopped and I thought for a second, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm in the open here. Maybe I need to take the plug out and put a couple more in, but I didn't want to get caught in that position. So I took three shells out of my pocket, held them in my hand and walked out with these shells in my hand and my gun ready the entire way out. But I wouldn't go, but maybe 50, 60, a hundred feet and stop in case something's following me. If I stop real quick, I can hear them take another couple of steps. That never happened. But what I do remember very vividly is praying. At least a quarter of the way in, I start praying really hard, making promises, you know, bargaining with the Lord. I promise you, Lord, I promise I will be a better person. I promise I will never kill another animal. And, you know, and to make a promise like that, you have to know deep down that what you're doing is wrong to begin with. If you're going to make a promise like that to God, you have to know deep down that it's just not right. And I was doing it anyway. That was going to be better. I was going to be nicer to people. Just get me out of here. And I was there was always this one place, this real bottomy, swampy place. It was clear. You could see 100 yards in either direction because water flowed through it. Uh, I just felt like this is where they are because I felt like they uh, remembering all these things coming back. This is where they were. This is where they watched me come through because I'd always got a creepy feeling there. This is what I'm thinking anyway, amongst the praying. So uh, I ease up to that and I'm just head on a swivel, just looking all over. Please, God, please, God, you know, this kind of still praying uh. wasn't there. But another little hill and the road turns and goes up a hill and then out to the main road. So I'm making the turn. I'm coming up the hill and I can see a house. Okay. And I can see my four wheelers 200 feet away and starting to open up. And I'm starting to, I'm going to make it out of here. Okay. He didn't follow me. I didn't hear him. They just, whatever it was, wanted me out of here. So I get to the top of the hill and for whatever reason, I stopped. And I turned around just to look, I guess. And as soon as I turned around, that's when I heard the very distinctive sound of a tree break. It was a tree or a tree limb. Whatever it was, was fresh because it was that crackle. Loud, like a rifle shot. That's when I ran. That's the first time I ran. I ran to my four-wheeler. And I think that was the most terrifying part was getting on my four-wheeler thinking he's behind me, whatever it is, is behind me. And I can't go forward because of where I pulled up. Uh, I have to back up toward this thing and he's just gonna snatch me right off the back of it. So I think that was probably, that was a, I, that, I think that's, that those feelings all in there are what stayed with me for so long. Thinking that this thing is going to kill me, not only that, nobody is going to know what happened to me. I'm right. just going to disappear. Yeah. But I get on my four wheeler, I get out on the road and I haul ass to the house, turn the road, turn on the road, get into the little horseshoe driveway. And I remember I, I was, I was going from my truck, I think. And I was like, no. And I went over to the side of the house 
And I think it was probably still rolling when I got off of it. And I hurried to my truck and I, I didn't open the back. I got in the front and I think I put my shotgun in the front. And I reached over and I grabbed my seven mag, which was always loaded. I checked, made sure it was loaded, cranked the truck, all the windows up, doors locked. And I sat there probably for a half hour at least, maybe longer than that. I don't, I don't remember how long I sat there, but it was a long time. Relieved for sure. But watching that back tree line, because I couldn't drive. Huh. Uh, it was going to be a few minutes uh, to collect myself, but all of these things coming back to me and kind of getting kind of angry with myself for doing what I had done, explaining it all the way. And how is this possible? How is it possible that I've been in these woods? I've heard of Bigfoot. I've seen Patterson Gimlin. I heard of Sasquatch. I might, I don't, I don't remember how I felt about it. I was probably that indifferent. I might've even thought it was possible but wouldn't be surprised if it was all a bunch of BS. Not a problem for South Mississippi, for sure. That's a mountain issue, you know, Northwest, yeah, wherever like you say, everything you hear. The furthest thing from your mind, though, at that time, Absolutely. in that moment, you not, like people say, get the, why don't you take a picture? You're not thinking of anything other than what, what you're dealing with at that moment. And the whole I, problem. The, the whole problem with the whole thing was not knowing. Not having a, even a slightest clue. I never saw a track. I never saw a structure that I thought was out of place. I mean, they probably had them, but something that I probably saw and thought was just deadfall. You know, and when you're not aware, why would you think anything else? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I get uh, I get home. Pretty sure it was that day. I get in and <clears throat> I just I. I, I I think I remember getting in the shower and getting cleaned up and getting out and going straight to my computer and looking up Bigfoot and there was just nothing. And I did it. I did it for a long time, but I was so, I was, I was changed. I was changed and I had a choice. I could either deal with it, go, I wasn't going back. There's no reason for me to ever go back again, or I can just keep my promises. I won't do any of that stuff anymore. I will become a better person. So that's what I did. I, I, tr I tried my best to engage with people, to be more outbeat. I've never been more of a blabbermouth until after that point, like I am now <clears throat> with people just wanting to talk and, you know, just be a better person all around, all the way around. It's a shame it had to be. You know, because of that, but that's what happened. I became someone this didn't happen to. And it affected, affected my marriage. This is not the person that my, you know, first wife married. We were married for 17 years. And that was the beginning of the end of that was me becoming somewhere, someone else. And, uh, I was good for probably eight years had moved on, changed my occupation, found a job where there had never been one Bigfoot sighting ever right out here in West Texas. So I had moved, I'd lived in Texas for a while. I had moved back to Mississippi. Linda and I had probably been together a couple months and, uh, I was, I'm sitting on the couch and I'm going through my phone and I'm watching YouTube and I see crypto reality. So I click on it and he's posting not some blob squatch picture. What he's getting is clear. And this is exactly what I saw. And I think that did something. I think uh, maybe some excitement or something. Maybe it's, well, here we go. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay. Maybe I can kind of get into this, but I think what it did <clears throat> was it triggered this anxiety this these reactions from my body it didn't matter how i felt in my head my body was going to react adversely in certain situations and it would just come I remember linda waking me up shaking me and i'm drenched coated in sweat and she's like who are you yelling at and I'm like, was i yelling at somebody you know bad nightmares driving down the road could look into the woods and get that 
that washed over field and have to, you know, ease home shaking. It was a problem. Linda, being a nurse, recognized this problem because it was affecting her. It was affecting our whole life. She says, okay, look, she knew. I told her everything that happened. She said, look, you're going to have to deal with this. Somehow, you're going to have to face it. And I was like, okay, well, I'll try researching. I contacted one person, the person that was getting exactly what I had seen, Mark Zasky. I sent him an email. We finally swapped numbers. We, we talked a lot. <clears throat> they invited me down there. So for about three months, I did. I went back and forth, and I did Bigfoot research. Um, was out around them. Um, was not for me. That wasn't going to work for me. I didn't care enough about them. I don't want to find them. I, I don't have anything to prove to myself. I don't think I can prove anything to anybody else, though what he's getting is pretty damn convincing. Sorry, kids. Swear jar. Uh, so after those three months, I, I just told him, look, I just I can't. This is just not for me. I can't do this anymore. So he's, they, you know, no hard feelings. Go your own way. So she said, you're still, you're, you know, we're still having these problems. She said, well, why don't you just talk to people that have had the same experience? I said, I don't know anybody that has had this experience. And there wasn't a lot of places you could go. There was, there was some Facebook groups. Uh, Sasquatch Chronicles is what I started listening to, to, to try to find people. And I was like, all right, well, if I'm going to do this, then I'm going to get a camera and I'm going to film them doing it. And then I think we had, I had reached out to just about everybody that was anybody in the subject uh, to do an interview. I hadn't even named the channel yet. And uh, Dustin Duncan responded. It's like, yeah, man, you can come interview me. I was like, okay, good. Well, we're not just going to do his encounter. We're going to tell the whole story. This is where Bigfoot Odyssey came in. Uh, that we had a couple other names picked out, uh, but settled on Bigfoot Odyssey because it's not us traveling. It's this person's journey yeah. through this and everything that they've dealt with. That's why every documentary you see of ours is like that. It's, it's a whole, it's an odyssey. And this being my odyssey here. And our whole format came from sitting, we're Lynn and I were on the couch watching Highlander. The movie and uh the original you know christopher lambert clancy brown you know there can be only one you know but he would he would be sitting there and he would think back 1518 or 1783 or whatever and then come back to the couch and i was like oh, this is how we're going to do this we're going to go and film them tell their story then we're going to go out to the field where it happened and then when they get to points we'll jump back and forth and that'll be our niche. So that's what we did. And so that's how we created Bigfoot Odyssey. And then uh, eventually created the Facebook group, which Daniela joined, was one of the first members to join the Facebook group. I think we might have had 30 or 40 people in it. And uh, the first I remember Daniela. You didn't get kicked out, did you? I did. I, did you I, remember. I got you I left. left. I came back and then I got yeah. kicked out. Well, <laughs> no. Yeah, well, well uh, what happened? People were just, it was just becoming another old Facebook group and people were just throwing these blobby, you know, zoomed in, you know, no context pictures. Look at this face. Yeah, there's an eye up here and an eye down here and a mouth kind of over here, you know, those pictures. And Daniel Jella just threw her hands up like, no, I'm not doing it. But you were one of the most active and vocal in there and calling these people out. And when you, I remember you left and I had sent you a message. I was like, what's up? You left? You gone? So I was like, look, come run the thing. Be be the moderator. You run all this. And then I think we had well, we have like seven thousand people there now. Quite a yeah, bit. Yeah. But that's how Daniel and I uh got together. And then I think I because we had so much time in between the travel shows, um, we decided we we're gonna do this live show. Uh just to have something to put out there just so we can stay, you know, somewhat relevant. And uh, so here we are now, um, two years later, Danielle and I, now Brad, 
we've it, we've gotten to this, but that's how all this came about. And back to everything that happened, I believe there are people texting me left and right. Um, I just believe the only reason any of it happened is because of what happened in 99. If none of that had happened, I would not have put myself out there around them so much. I mean, I, I can remember this is how this is how much I was into just being there. I can remember wanting to get to an area, but I didn't want to walk through the creek bed where I thought they would and leave my scent. So I went through the thicket on my belly with my rifle in front of me, Marine style, a good ways, 20 or 30 yards, just trying to get to a place where I had a clear shot down to the creek bed. This turns out to be the same place that when I would sit in, I had a tree climber in this one area and I would go up 20 feet. I'd get way up there and I had a Primos can call. It's a dough bleat and I would hit it bit. Bit, you turn it over every time I did that something would just come crashing through the woods toward me I mean breaking limbs in my mind it's a moose you know white tailed deer but a hoss but it happened so much it would just come right to the edge of the thicket 40 feet away and stop every single time and I think I remember getting down and maybe trying to go in there, but it was just too thick to even try to get in there to it. But this, whatever this buck was, was outsmarting me. Well, after this happened, it's one of these things. They were trying to run me out of there quite a bit. I was just too dumb to know what was happening. I had to see it. And the whole, if you, if you think, if you believe in serendipity, if you believe that, that you're meant to do something, I had to see it the way I saw it in order to do this. If I'd have just seen it, I could have kind of explained it away. Maybe if I just seen it walking through the woods, I had to see it the way I saw it in order to do this. So maybe this is what I was meant to do was this. I hope it is. I, we're here anyway. Well, there's all right. Could be a reason, you know, like you say, these things, uh, you know, re quite rare. I know lots of people have seen them, but especially have an experience like like that and for it to then, well, I mean, it's taken over your life to some degree, whether you wanted it to or not. And it's yeah. actually an important part of your life now. Uh, what, 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 what it's become now before Odyssey in your experience. And there has to be a reason, you know, why, why some well, it was a choice. Be that close to hear them speak, to to see what it did. I mean, these are these are details that not everybody gets to see, and it shows you through. I still had to choose. I still had to choose to do this. And if there's a moral to the whole story, it's sometimes you got to lose yourself to become who you really are. Hmm. I was intentionally being someone that I knew I wasn't. For my own selfish reason and then god said nope shouldn't be right out of it so here we are and it's all because of because of that still i don't like going in the woods i don't want to look for bigfoot i don't care anything about them what i care about are you people people that run into these things that are unaware because i believe wholeheartedly that it is that sudden moment of realization that affects you that's that brands you that stays with you for so long you can't shake it you, you cannot shake that feeling it is an abject fear that's what it is if you're going to be honest with yourself that's what it is and it has a physical effect on you and if you don't deal with it it's going to come out of you later just like it did me something had to trigger it but it did it came out and nightmares and anxiety and it was a mess. It was a wreck. Wouldn't eat. Dark circles under my eyes. I just, I, I was in bad shape. I went to, I did, I did one session of therapy and I did the two sessions of emotional freedom techniques. And I, that worked some, but when, it, when it's that long, there's no getting rid of it. There's not. This, this does it for me. 
I'll always do this. If two people are watching, I'll do this because I do it not just for you, but hey, I got to do it for me too. Well, it's where it started from, isn't it? It's where it started it from. And uh, you've, you've done a great thing because you've reached out to so many people who in turn maybe have reached out to so many people. It's like a domino effect. And, you know, you've, you've got a really good thing going now in terms of being a support so. network that's started for people to not to talk but just to listen. And, you know, it's more than what you had when it happened to you. So a lot's changed in terms of, you know, what's more important is the people that are experiencing it because Bigfoot's not not really that touchable, is it? Uh, we're going to have more success in helping people than actually trying to find Bigfoot, I think. We can accomplish this. Yeah. We can accomplish awareness. We're not going to be able to prove Bigfoot exists without going out and getting one, you know, and that's yeah. not happening. Yeah. Uh, Scottish Wildman says you should do a reconstruction short film of that day. Oh, what a great <laughs> idea. Yeah, <laughs> we did one that. one of your documentaries. Oh, you did. Yeah, we did do that. Yeah. Uh, episode five, Wildman, of our Big Odyssey documentaries. If you go to our channel and you see playlists, you go in there and there's a little drop down arrow you hit that arrow and it shows all of everything daniela put all that together but our 13 documentaries are in there and it's the fifth one if you want to watch that and see where everything happened and hear me tell the whole thing all over again but there were there was a lot of other things that happened to me out there that i just i never did talk about small things being followed having things thrown at me uh just what sasquatch do to mess with you for whatever reason I still think to this day they thought they thought that I that I knew just from the interactions we had. Mm -hmm. I thought they probably thought I knew they were there anyway, but I didn't. I was completely and totally oblivious. They must have thought, you know, he's just not reacting to us. What 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 are we gonna do to get him to notice us? Maybe. Who knows? Yeah. One of them drew the short well, straw. Whatever it was that day. Whatever it was that day, me doing a lot of things different hunting in a different place. I burned off, you know, a nice little area, uh, hunting past deer season, hunting turkeys. And now I've got all the turkeys, at least a whole bunch of them are coming to me. So, I mean, did he think I was going to get all of them? Whatever it was, he, he wanted me out. And if you think, I think hearing me tell it, it sounds like it lasted a lot longer than it did, but I've done this a couple times close my eyes and do my best to to recreate the whole thing and time it and it's almost a minute from the time i saw him to the time he walked away he walked right on around and he was he didn't wasn't out in the open he was still being slick he was standing in a gap right beside that right beside that one tree and the other tree just to the right of it but he was probably at that tree for 20 seconds maybe just mm -hmm saw me and i waved at him what do you think he thought about that maybe maybe he thought i should have been scared when i first saw him you know like, hey. oh really you're gonna wave you're gonna wave hmm. yeah. so he comes around but just comes walks around comes up to the tree bitches at me and leaves and it completely and totally changed my entire life freaked me out still freaks me out to think about the times i was out there camping just being out at night, walking through the woods at night. Yeah. So you know, I know they were there. Mm. They watched me. They watched me do so much stuff out there. No doubt. Not a doubt in my mind. But you've got a show, don't you? I've got a show in five minutes. We'll have to do it part two where we can answer some questions from people because uh, there was a few put up tonight. But um, okay, we went into a lot of detail. And we didn't, I yeah, know. well, I try to make it, I try to give a little bit more yeah. than what the normal person hears on any other channel I've ever done, just to kind of, and if we hadn't lost Eric, I would, you know, I had, we had to have something. This Sunday Encounters is the only encounter I know of is mine, so, experience. <sighs> mm. And I know for sure there are Sasquatch behind my house, where we live, Lynn and I live in Popperville, Mississippi. 
we're on the edge of 2,500 acres of pine and there's a pond that I didn't even know was there. You can't get to, it's probably got a 20 pound bass in it. Nobody ever fishes it. There's water right there. Place I heard the knock. That one loud that I just didn't even acknowledge just went inside. So I think they're all around there. I think they're oh, everywhere. Definitely. But definitely. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll let you go and get ready for your show. Yeah. What's happening? Uh, I've got pork and beans on uh, from the pork and beans show. Okay. Uh, it's going to be interesting. We're going to delve into well, cool. kind of woo side of Sasquatch. Uh, it's going to be interesting, I think. And it's going to lead to another show on the 28th where we have Kevin back, Kevin Saunders, who has we've nice. talked about speaking Sasquatch language. I'm going to have three different guests on who are all experiencing that on the 28th. So this is like an intro to Pork and Beans tonight. So if anyone wants to join us in about three minutes, uh, I need to go and swap stuff and everything. So um, Yeah, go do your thing. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Uh, are you staying on? Yes. Okay. Catch no, you later. no, I'm going to go. You know, okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Uh,